Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Jill Robbins reports on Hyperloop technology, and I have a story on bamboo farming in Uganda. Brian Lynn has the science report on NASA research about the upcoming solar eclipse. Later, Jill and Andrew Smith present the lesson of the day. But first... A 420-meter white steel tube running alongside a railway line in the northern Netherlands could be the start of a new kind of transportation for people and goods. The tube is the heart of the new European Hyperloop Center that opened recently in Findam. Developers will be testing the changing technology there over the coming years. Hyperloop technology was once supported by business leader Elon Musk. It involves capsules that float on magnetic fields that move at speeds of around 700 kilometers per hour through low-pressure tubes. Its supporters say it is far more efficient than short flights, high-speed rail, and trucks. When Musk first presented the idea, he said it could transport people the nearly 645 kilometers between Los Angeles and San Francisco in 30 minutes. But since then, progress has been slow to get from an idea to the real world. Sasha Lame is the center's director. He expects to have the first Hyperloop route by 2030. He predicts it might be about 5 kilometers and will transport people. He said, there's already preparations being done for such routes in, for example, Italy or India. Not everybody shares such hopeful thoughts about Hyperloop's future. Robert Noland is a professor at the Blostein School of Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers University in New Jersey. He told the Associated Press that policymakers chase after big ideas of the future but they should invest in simpler transportation structures. He added, it costs too much to build. Lame said non-believers should come and take a look for themselves. He said, we built the European Hyperloop Center, and from what we have built, we know that we can be competitive with high-speed rail. And he noted that, they have not added all of the ways they can reduce costs over the next 10 years. The test center's tube is made up of 34 separate sections, mostly 2.5 meters wide. A piece of equipment next to the tube removes air in the tube to reduce the pressure from inside the tube. That reduces air resistance and permits capsules to travel at such high speeds. A capsule built by Dutch Hyperloop company, Hart Hyperloop, will be tested next month. It receives financial support from private investments, local and national governments, and the European Commission. The Fiendam tube has a switch where it splits into two separate tubes that capsules can go through. Marinus von der Mees is Hart's Technology and Engineering Director. He said, switching is very important for Hyperloop because it permits capsules to travel anywhere on a real-life network. While testing continues in Findam, Hyperloop developers hope that routes for their technology will be coming. Lame said, the main difficulty is finding government approval to build routes. And, he said, finding new financial support to test and show the technology is what is needed to make this happen. I'm Jill Robbins.
Bamboo farming is on the rise in Uganda. The strong and fast-growing crop is seen by the East African government as having real growth possibility. Along a three-kilometer stretch of the River Ruizi, Environment Protection officers recently planted new bamboo seedlings and cleared room for last year's survivors to grow. The River Ruizi is the most important river in western Uganda, that includes the major city of Mumbarara. A successful bamboo forest would protect the river against sand miners. Farmers and others whose activities have long threatened it. The National Environment Management Authority estimates that the Ruizi has lost 60 percent of its water collection area over many years. In some areas, the river runs as narrow as a stream. Once bamboo is established, it is almost like a net," said Jaconius Musingwire. He is an environment officer who was the project's technical advisor. The roots trap everything, including the surface runoff, and stabilize the weaknesses of the banks. In Uganda, bamboo can be burned for fuel in rural communities, taking pressure off shrinking forests of eucalyptus and other natural resources. It is a strong plant that can grow almost anywhere. And businesses can turn it into products ranging from furniture to toothpicks. Some of the bamboo species grown in Uganda are imported from Asia, but many grow wild. One kind has shoots that are smoked and then boiled to make a popular traditional meal in eastern Uganda. The Ugandan government has set a ten-year policy. That calls for planting 300,000 hectares of bamboo. Most of it will be grown on private land by 2029 as part of wider reforestation efforts. That is a high target. The Uganda Bamboo Association, the largest such group with 340 members, has planted only 500 hectares. Even with growing interest in bamboo farming. Officials will have to push more farmers in rural parts of Uganda to plant large areas of land with bamboo. A single bamboo pole brings in a little less than a dollar, so farmers need to grow a lot to earn enough. Bamboo promoters are urging them to see a bamboo plantation as the same kind of money-making crop as coffee or tea. Banks are offering bamboo plantation capital loans that promise ownership of large forests of bamboo. Steve Tusime owns a bamboo nursery. It has sold fewer than ten thousand seedlings in the past two years, but Tusime said, "Bamboo is going to be a game changer in Africa. You can eat bamboo. You can use it to build." You can create an industry for bamboo. You can feed it to your animals, and it can take care of your land. Scientists plan to closely study next week's total solar eclipse to learn new things about the sun and our own planet. The eclipse can be seen on April 8 across most of North America and parts of the Atlantic and Pacific oceans. The event will cause the moon to completely block out sunlight. For up to four minutes and twenty-eight seconds in a narrower area, 
millions of people are expected to fully experience the eclipse within the so-called path of totality, where there will be a brief total blockage of the sun. The event gives scientists an unusual chance to study the sun and learn how Earth's atmosphere reacts during a total solar eclipse. So the American Space Agency, NASA, will launch several observation projects. Scientists have long used solar eclipses to make scientific discoveries, said Kelly Korek. She is a program scientist at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Korek said among past discoveries were the first identification of helium and details about the sun's influence on Earth's upper atmosphere. Scientists will center a lot of their efforts on the sun's outermost atmosphere, known as the corona. Cameras and instruments will closely examine the corona, which is normally hard to observe because of the brightness of the sun. NASA's WB-57 research airplanes can make these observations. The jets can operate 15,000 meters or more above Earth's surface. The aircraft will help search for new details of structures in the middle and lower corona, a NASA statement said. The space agency noted that studies of the corona can provide new information about how solar activity influences Earth. Images taken during the eclipse might also help astronomers learn more about dust rings around the sun and help them find unknown asteroids orbiting near the sun. NASA will be flying WB-57 planes equipped with cameras and instruments along the eclipse path. These aircraft will look for increases in charged particle flows called plasma and other solar materials from the corona. Another project will involve the agency's sounding rockets. The rockets are designed to make short trips while collecting data and completing scientific experiments. NASA said it plans to launch three sounding rockets during the total solar eclipse. The rockets to be launched from Virginia will examine possible changes within the ionosphere, an electrically charged part of the atmosphere near the edge of space. The rockets will launch at different periods to study how the sudden drop in sunlight affects our upper atmosphere. The first rocket will blast off 45 minutes before totality happens. The second will be sent during the height of the eclipse, and the third will launch 45 minutes after. Each rocket will deploy four small instruments built to measure changes in electric and magnetic fields, density, and temperature. NASA said these experiments will aim to measure just how widespread the effects of an eclipse are. NASA and other research groups will receive help from many citizen scientists carrying out their own observations. These individuals will take pictures of the sun's corona during different parts or stages of the eclipse. Citizen scientists will observe the behaviors of birds and other animals as darkness arrives in the middle of the day. They will also measure dropping temperatures, observe clouds, and use ham radios to test international communication signals. College students will launch more than 600 weather balloons along the path of totality. 
The balloons are designed to identify atmospheric changes as they happen. In addition to those efforts, three U.S. radar stations are in the path of the upcoming total solar eclipse. The stations, which are normally used to observe space weather, will attempt to measure changes in the upper atmosphere when the sky goes dark. Research activities have been carried out during past total solar eclipses. But this time, scientists note that the moon is closer to Earth, meaning April's event will result in a longer period of darkness and a wider path of totality. NASA's Korek said this fact has researchers very interested in the science results. Any time we can observe for longer, that gives scientists more data, she said. I'm Brian Lynn. Brian Lynn is here now to talk more about his science report. Thanks for being here, Brian. Of course, Dan. Glad to be here. This week, you looked at preparations scientists are making to study the upcoming total solar eclipse in North America. The researchers said they hope to learn more from this particular eclipse than previous ones. Why is this? Yes, scientists have said they hope to learn more things from this eclipse for two main reasons. First, the upcoming event will see the sun blocked for a longer period. Um, this one is estimated to last about four and a half minutes, which is about twice as long as the last eclipse that darkened skies back in 2017. So the fact that it will be longer will give researchers more observation time and will also permit more time to deploy people and equipment and the second reason is because this eclipse will have a wider path of totality than the last one, um, also providing more research possibilities. Interesting. Thanks again for joining me, Brian. You're welcome. Thank you, Dan. And my name is Jill Robbins. And I'm Andrew Smith. You're listening to the Lesson of the Day on the Learning English Podcast. Welcome to the part of the show where we help you do more with our series, Let's Learn English. The series shows Ana Mateo in her work and life in Washington, D.C. Being in Washington gives Ana the opportunity to meet people from all over the world. And she likes that a lot. Or as she would say, she thinks that's awesome. Anna thinks a lot of things are awesome. She is a very enthusiastic person. If you're enthusiastic, it means you have a lot of positive feelings and energy about something. She's quite enthusiastic. To her, it's so fantastic. Living in the capital, the capital known as D.C., well, thanks for that little jingle, Andrew. Well, maybe it will help people remember the words enthusiastic and fantastic. Maybe. So, as we were saying, Anna likes to meet people from different parts of the world. And in Lesson 16, she is excited. This is very exciting. <clears throat> Excuse me. As I was saying, Anna is excited because she gets to interview tourists who are visiting Washington, D.C. Let's listen to her first interview. Hello! Washington, D.C. has many tourists. People from different countries come here. Today, my job is to interview tourists. I have to learn why they come here. This is very exciting. Excuse me, I'm Ana Mateo from 
the news. Do you have time for an interview? Sure, I have time. What is your name? My name is Sabrina. What country are you from? I'm from Bangladesh. So you are Bangladeshi? That's right. My nationality is Bangladeshi. Do you like Washington, D.C.? Yes, the city is very beautiful. What do you like to do in Washington, D.C.? I like history. So I like walking around and looking at all the monuments and memorials. They make history come alive. Washington has many monuments and memorials. The Washington Monument is behind us. Which is your favorite? Uh, I really like Lincoln Memorial. It is very beautiful. And it feels like Abraham Lincoln is still alive. Awesome. Thank you for your time, Sabrina. You are welcome. Visiting the monuments and memorials in D.C. is also important to many Americans. And you'll notice that the word memorial sounds similar to the word memory. That's because the two words share the same root, the Latin word memoria. And a memorial is something that pays respect to the memory of the lives of people who have died. Washington, D.C. has memorials to presidents, such as Abraham Lincoln and Thomas Jefferson, to the civil rights leader, Martin Luther King, Jr., and to soldiers who have fought in wars. Examples of these are the Vietnam Memorial and the World War II Memorial. Memorials can be inspiring, but also somber at the same time. That's right. Somber means serious or sad. And when we talk about the monuments in Washington, most of those include the memorials. A monument is a large structure, usually made out of stone, built to remind people of a famous person or a famous historical event. And the adjective monumental means very large or very important. So, for example, we can say that the Apollo moon landings were a monumental achievement. And Anna would probably say the moon landings were awesome. And I think she's right. They were pretty amazing. Speaking of Anna, I noticed something she said pretty quickly when she was interviewing tourists. She used the common expression, a couple of. In English, the exact meaning of a couple is two of anything. So if you want a couple of apples, that means you want two apples. But native speakers are not always so exact. When they say a couple of, they just mean a few or a small number. Let's listen to Anna say that. We'll listen a couple of times. In this case, exactly two. Oh, excuse me. I am Anna Mateo from The News. Do you have time for a couple of questions? Hello, I am Ana Mateo from The News. Do you have time to answer a couple of questions? A couple of is one of those expressions native speakers usually say quickly. Instead of saying of, we just say a, uh, because it's quicker. Lesson 16 of Let's Learn English has a pronunciation video that helps you practice this. Let's listen. When English speakers use the expression a couple of to talk about two things, they often say of quickly. It sounds like a couple of. Listen to Anna ask a tourist to answer a couple of questions. Oh, excuse me. I am Anna Mateo from The News. Do you have time for a couple of questions? I noticed another thing Anna said when she asked tourists for an interview. We're going to listen to a couple of examples. Oh, excuse me. I am Anna Mateo from The News. Do you have time for a couple of questions? Hello, 
I am Ana Mateo from the news. Do you have time to answer a couple of questions? You'll notice that in the first example, Ana said each of the three words, do you have, clearly. Ana started speaking more quickly in the second example. You can still hear each of the three words, but the words do you sound like one word, do you. Do you have time to answer a couple of questions? And what would happen if Anna started speaking even faster? Do you have is such a common and short phrase that native speakers usually say it very quickly, like this. Do you have? The word you becomes reduced to the sound ya. So it sounds like this. Do you have? I think this might be easy and fun for our listeners to practice saying quickly. Listen first to Jill and me as we ask and answer questions. Then we'll give you a chance to listen and repeat. Do you have it? I don't have it. Do you want it? I don't want it. Do you need it? I don't need it. Do you know it? I don't know it. Do you see it? I don't see it. Do you have to? I don't have to. Do you like it? I don't like it. Do you mean it? I don't mean it. Now, listen just to the question and then repeat it with your own voice. Do you have it? Do you want it? Do you need it? Do you know it? Do you see it? Do you feel it? Do you have to? Do you like it? Do you mean it? Good job, listeners. You've probably noticed that if you want to sound more like a native speaker, you have to learn to put small words together quickly and not say each vowel sound the way you do when you are speaking slowly. Do you want to repeat some of those phrases one more time? Sure. Listen to me say these phrases quickly. And if you have something to write with, try to jot down what I'm saying. Jot down means to write quickly. Jot is spelled J-O-T. Okay. I'm going to count to three and then say them quickly. Listeners, are you ready? One, two, three. Do you have it? Do you want it? Do you need it? Do you know it? Do you see it? Do you feel it? Do you have to? Do you like it? Do you mean it? I think that list is too fast to jot down all at once, but don't worry. You can go back and listen again. Andrew, I noticed that when you read the list quickly, it had an even beat, almost like music. That's right. And listening to the rhythm of English can be helpful for learning how to pronounce it well. So you can clap your hands while you listen, like this. Do you have it? Do you want it? Do you need it? Do you know it? Do you see it? Do you feel it? Do you have to? Do you like it? Do you mean it? Keep listening for the ways native speakers say small words and short phrases quickly. And then try to imitate what you hear. You can find many useful examples in Let's Learn English and other VOA programs. And thanks for listening to the lesson of the day on the Learning English Podcast. I'm Jill Robbins. And I'm Andrew Smith. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. 